squat scorn this video is sponsored by squarespace the antoine dupont of website builders four years ago french rugby shifted after a decade of underperformance and Uge, the sublime scrum half dyad of dupont and gartier announced that era was over france were now a serious team. A young side glistened as they took an English team, fresh off the hurt of losing a World Cup final, to La Neton Yates. We looked set for similar on Friday night as two teams fresh off the hurt of not contesting a World Cup final met in Marseille to begin principal photography for the latest Netflix original. French rugby was desperate to get itself back on track after a soul-shattering quarter-final. And for Irish rugby, it was urgent to remain on course for what they'd looked to be on before that same weekend rolled around. And yet, instead, this time out, only Irish rugby shifted. Andy Farrell's Irish team putting in one of their greatest performances in Six Nations history as they conquered Marseille to leave France so broken they're probably only one drink away from recalling their bad boy ex-winger. So how did Ireland rip up Les Bleus? What did France get wrong? And how does Friday night set either team up for the rest of the championship? Ireland are entering this tournament in a very different place to everyone else. Where Wales and England are in full-on rebuild mode, Italy welcoming a new coat, Scotland going for a full-on existential crisis, and France sort of settled, sort of rebuilding, and sort of always having an existential crisis, that's just called being French, the Irish are just in it to win it. So much of Friday night felt like a supercut of the things Ireland do well. The critical Calvin Nash score right after half time is maybe the finest example of the lot. There's no big, ingenious, super skill or powerful play moment that creates the try. It's a steady, slow deconstruction through sheer efficiency. Peter Romani here takes the line out, and as this makes him the most pinned in player, once Arky's made his crash up, they slot him in on the wing because everyone else is in freer position to go and fill another role. As they look to exploit how hard the French pack overwork here, or filling into the space inside Arky. Antonio is alone on the wing because he initially isn't watching anyone, but once they notice Omani's taking a wide position, he calls Luku into his support. The pair fell, bitterness his own boy, and Ireland hit Arky again, getting two passes away from contact, meaning they take out the hard working French pack once more, Olivon narrowly missing the tackle. For phase after phase then, the same players take position in similar spaces, Ireland hitting back and forth, never needing a big reset or players to come in and find their space because their key carriage is hopping back up to their feet and being instantly in near enough the right position. This set of sequences sees 15 instances of a player carrying or taking contact, yet just six Irishmen do all of the carrying. The French pack, on the other hand, drilled to push themselves, are working left and right constantly. Keep an eye in particular on hooker Peter Mavaka, who only makes one tackle in this movement, but is in position within a metre or so of every single ruck, busting a gut to get in position all the time, where his Irish counterparts never need move more than a yard or so because the system is so built for efficiency. The ball coming back the same players over and over again, all built to give them as many players on their feet as possible. And when it does eventually head away from the same right at the post zone, the full French pack has been tied tied in, tied out, and pulled out of shape. Instead of all being around the ruck, because Ireland have moved them about so much, Antonio is left in the fly half channel with Jalabert covering 13. Antonio makes a brilliant tackle, but all it takes is one offload to draw Penno and put Nash away in the corner. It's so efficient. Watching Ireland attack feels a bit like playing a sports video game that you've put too many hours into and worked out there's one way round the CPU that sees you score every single time. It's planning and execution above all else. Timing and strategy just worked out within an inch of their lives. And to just demonstrate how smart and composed their attack is. I just want to compare how Ireland run, arguably the most basic component of modern attack being a crash ball off first phase, to Scotland, first half Scotland, the weekend's next most successful team. For the sake of comparison, both are being played off a more or less lost momentum here, meaning they have a chance to assess the defence slightly beforehand before chucking someone up the middle. Scotland, as such, identify the biggest split in the Welsh defence. The defender that's covering the most area to themselves is the fly half, also the weakest tackle in the team almost always, so they send their biggest carrier, so the only two pull to, at that gap. Costello has to track a lot of ground to get there, Tupelot who bounces him, and the tackle is made in collaboration with Tompkins for ultimately a gain line success of 2 metres that allows Scotland to begin an attack. 
However, where Scotland are doing pretty well on pretty good vibes, Ireland's planning and execution instead comes to the fore. On the lineup that begins it, Scotland throw to the tail. This is a decision that's completely disconnected from what the backs do next. Ireland, on the other hand, are fully aware what's coming and so chuck to the front. Where Scotland look to crab their maul outwards, Ireland move inwards towards the touchline. This means when the defence comes up, Aldry has to start tight to mark Gibson Park. Wales and France each have one back row in the line, plus two centres, a fly half, a winger and a full back out wide but kind of in the backfield. Ireland's decision to throw to the front has France covering maybe 45 metres versus Scotland to the tail meaning Wales are covering 30-ish. These metres have to go somewhere, so France shove as many of them as possible in Aldrich's pocket, creating a big gap between him and Dante here. This is what Ireland want to target, but instead of sending Arky at it, they make the space come to him. Arky starts as the tip of an arrowhead. Crowley wraps around into his boot, that's the space behind him, with Crowley running a short line off him. However, Winger Nash, a superb distributor and ball player himself, also wraps into Crowley's boot, giving Ireland two pullback options, and Fiku, like on many of my own Friday nights, finds himself watching four men all in fluid motion. If Tua Pilato tips this ball out the back to Russell, Watkin can easily cover him and the Welsh defence are numbered up to smother them. Ireland, on the other hand, have forced France into defending more space, yet their own attack is so compact. Because of the greater width and stack shape behind Arky, if Ireland tipped this to Crowley, each of these defenders would need to buy inwards one, forcing Dante to drift out to cover their space behind. As such, he is thinking about this, so Arky's tiny dummy acts as the final straw. Dante is on his bike and it moves that gap to right in front of Bundy's bonds. When he receives the ball, Arky is positioned between Dante and Fiku. But the detail of Ireland's attack forces France to drift hard enough that the gap comes to him, leaving him between Dante and Aldry, the number eight busting a gut to catch him, eventually dragging him to ground nine metres over the game line, seven more than Tua Pilotu's carry. Gibson Park is instantly in position, standard, and able to keep the attack flooding forward through McCarthy. This passage ultimately leads to nothing, but it's a great micro example of why Ireland are so good. What other teams view as a simple chuck it to a big lad in a little bit of space, for them, is expanded into a complex equation with so many moving parts, and they find the most efficient way, the most careful and considered way to maximise the damage that one big lad can do. It's the same approach, incidentally, that they take to making websites. By heading to Squarespace, Ireland are able to apply the same concepts of efficiency and detail to their online lives. Squarespace's new fluid engine works much like Ireland's attack, stacking systems on systems, ideas on ideas, and pages on pages that you integrate anything you like in the world. The actual world. If Ireland want to throw a cross kick in, it's easy for Crowley to rebalance the attack and give them a prime opportunity to do that. But if you want to integrate, I don't know, a video into a web page that you've built or add social media content or share it to social media or have an online storefront with all sorts of stats back end for you to track how the sales are going you can do just that so simply drag and drop click a few buttons no coding or complexity required whatsoever and you're able to build a beautiful website so simply and better yet right if you want to save yourself some money on doing just that head to the link in the description and use the offer code squid rugby to get building your own website right now today you can't build islands attack yourself but you can build a squarespace website it's the next best thing and yet whilst the attack and constructs are impressive perhaps the most critical part of islands game on friday night was how they dismantled france's biggest strength not that one the the one that he wasn't playing the other the other one under Galtier and his former halfback partner and attack coach, Laurent Lebede, France kicked more than any other team in the world. This was done with a pretty clear philosophy. Instead of Springbok-style contestables or Warren Ball-type defensive rushes, France kicked long. Untermack and co stabbing it into places where the opposition would kick it back, hopefully giving them counterattack chances or phases against less aligned defences. This would often take the form of lengthy duels. Ramos et al engaging opponents over and over, kicking it back and forth, looking to find space and turn them, sometimes with as many as eight or nine consecutive kicks, pushing them back, waiting for the D to misalign or opposition fullback to concede and put it out in the full, or just kick it loosely because they're under pressure, give them a chance to attack, or walk away with a net gain. And yet, right, this is a tactic that has taken France to the top of the world. But Ireland were able to negate this almost entirely with one tiny tactical shift and a very useful banana cannon. France attempted three such duels in the opening 20 minutes of the match. The first, one minute in, finds James Lowe in the backfield and he simply refuses to engage. The approach the Springboks took in the World Cup, hanging in the air instead. However, the second one is the one that's really interesting. This begins with an elaborate move to bring the wingers up flat, hopefully, so Ramos can stick it in behind. But frankly, the move is not great. 
it's overcomplicated. There's one pass too many. If we compare it to the similar idea being run by Leinster in a game containing many of the same players last year, this pass goes directly to Lowe near the 50 meter mark, meaning the opposition have no time to adjust and he's in a better position to put the kick in, resulting in a 50-22. By sending it through Fiku first and leaving Ramos more central and deeper, Lowe himself has time to identify what they're doing and sprint back into position to cover. Tommy Wiseau's more cursed brother sends it as long as he can, forcing Ramos to backtrack and then trap the ball 20 meters behind his original kick. France are now on the back foot in the duel instantly. Ramos replies and Lowe covers easily and because he's had to backtrack to the 22 there's no real French chase to speak of and Lowe can make it up to the halfway before putting in an absolute beauty. Stopping just short of their ball line leaving Jalibert for choice. Either because he's a goal line dropout which France are no doubt on red alert about after Ireland's opening try in this fixture one year ago or attempt to just make as much ground of a touch finder as he possibly can. Jalabeth fires it to just outside the French 22, gifting Ireland the position for the opening try over the game. It's simple as a big old heck, but by switching Keenan and Lowe whenever France looked to kick long, Ireland were able to shut that shit down instantly. A few minutes later, Labler initiate the third kicking duel, and whilst Crowley puts in the first couple, once Ramos managed to get a good reply and a good kick in, Ireland just wait, give it to James Lowe, now he's got into position, and his utter cannon of a left foot fires it towards touch. And so, we get the 20 minute mark in the match. France have attempted free kicking duels. They've managed to have two. One, they lost 20 metres. The other, they lost 30 metres and the ball. So, they quit. Recognising their bread and butter tactic is only losing them ground, France don't initiate another kicking duel for the entire remainder of the match, only engaging one of Ireland's attempts, which was in the dying minutes, when they're massively on the back for stuck in their own 22, and in the process, give away the penalty that grants Ireland the position for Ronan Kelleher's ceiling score. They lost faith, they lost confidence, and they lost their key tactic. After just 20 minutes, France found themselves 10-0 down and forced into a major rethink of their tactics on the game. From that last duel onwards, France had 13 passages of possession around halfway in the middle two sections of the field, positions where they almost always kick the ball long, and kick the ball just twice. Both contestable box kicks, a tactic that they normally lean on less than any other tier 1 team in the world, and both prompted by some major backwards momentum that forced them to kick it away. France didn't go back to their duelling tactic once, instead they just kept hold the ball for the other 11 passages of possession in the match. Two of them right? Ireland gave away a penalty. One of them, France made a clean break and got up to the Irish 22, albeit not one that they were able to convert into points. The other eight times that France found themselves in the middle of the field, they ran up blind alleys until they got turned over by Ireland because they're afraid of going back to the kicking game. It didn't take long for Ireland to adapt to France's suicidal run-everything energy, committing more forwards into the wider channels and making usually risky decisions such as this that they knew would pay off. A tiny dink over the top to exit from their own 22, it avoids any thought of a duel, has a chance of them regaining the ball as well, and best of all, means if Labour do recover, this situation flares up, right? Down a man anyway, thanks to Paul Willemse using his shoulders without using his head, Ireland throw 13 and a half men into the main line. The backfield cover no longer needed, allowing Joe McCarthy to spoot Jalibert and Bielbarre into a knock-off. France found themselves swamped, cooked, and served up on a platter. Deep fried cockerel, the dish of the day. Now, France have replaced Laurent Lebede with new attack coach Patrick Aralates over the winter, and I both hope for their own sake and assume, based on the opening 20 minutes, their refusal to kick was on account of what Ireland were doing in riposte, instead of a new approach from Aralates. France kicked the least, right? any team in the Six Nations or Rugby Europe Championship this weekend after being the side who booted it the most in the world for four straight years. This was a drastic, drastic change brought on from pretty much the 20-minute mark onwards. And it just allowed Ireland to intensify the pressure they were already serving up, really disconnecting Luku from his surroundings. Here, France recover a great kick by Bordeaux's boldest bastard, and when the sequence of passes brings Antonio onto the ball, you figure France are finally into their rumble, they're doing that thing they do, except Caelan Doris just spins around to remain alive as a threat, forcing Luku himself to clear him out. By then comes in a scrum half and throws an average pass to Jalibert, and it gives the defence time to shoot up. They eventually get it to ground, but France are so loose and so out of shape, Fiku is forced to form part of a forward pod because nobody else is around, and he gets his positioning wrong, entering the ruck from a bad position, bad angle, allowing Josh van der Fleer to cause all sorts of chaos, shit stay from stumbling backwards, and Fiku himself forced to play nine to prevent the ball being stolen. This offload looks lovely, but it leaves Aldri isolated. Luku once again barrowed backwards, with Ramos clearing out alone. 
the ball spilling out for a very clean and tidy Irish turnover, all from getting to the heart, the shape and the structure of France so simply, through their kicking game, through their defence and through pressuring Luku enormously. Because it didn't even stop there. France's other great weapon has been their defence, and yet Jameson Gibson Park's opening score is a perfect example of how Ireland configured an attack to decimate that particular aggressive way that a Sean Edwards defence defends. This is Ireland's seventh line out of the game, but the first that they throw to McCarthy, using more regular options, Byrne and Omani, as decoys here to allow them to have clean ball critically at the tail of the lineup, allowing Gibson Park to get onto Doris before the French D is up in their face. Edwards' system is about two things, right? Aggression and connection. Coincidentally, the only two words on Peter Romani's dating profile, and Ireland want to use the pair of those features against each other. Turn the features into bugs. Aldri is drifting hard into this space, but the two centres bide their time, knowing a big hit is coming. Dante, sure enough, absolutely melts Crowley. I would not want to be Jack Crowley in this situation, and it forces Fiku and Jalabet to each jam in one on low. Each little pass in the sequence designed to just tempt a French player into doing exactly what Dante does, selling himself for the aggression, sacrificing the connection. This takes both French centres out of the game, and even more crucially, Ireland have got to the edge of the French defence and set a platform without being at the edge of the pitch. Moafana is the only man out here, with Ramos then sliding up to help cover the space, meaning when Arki and Henshaw reload quickly, Lucid prop by and Aldri and his bus gut are still taking position as the ball comes out super fast. Moafana hasn't had time to reset based on Aldrich's position, and this lovely zip ball to Henshaw forces him to just commit to the guy in front of him. Without time to check who's outside him, spoiler, it's Bundy Aki. Henshaw slips to Aki, who bursts through. Gibson Park running the kind of line that prompts commentators everywhere to say, like all good scum halves. On the inside, it would take the offload, and with Ramos having filled in out wide, he's now against only a panicking Penno, trying desperately to fill in but not doing so in the same time. It's brilliant, carefully constructed two phase score from which Labler never recover. There's a legitimate concern by now about how much not winning that home World Cup, bombing out so early on in the thing a generation had told themselves would be the best moment of their lives, the best moment of their country's rugby history, may continue to get to France. And now coming up against a team able to disrupt them so greatly, able to rip them open, bolstered by the absence of Antimac and Antoine, two players capable of providing gorgeous bullshit plan B options to keep France in games, may set things back even further. What we saw on Saturday was one of the most impressive Six Nations performances Ireland have ever put in, and the cleanest, most brilliant game plan to disrupt and dismantle a world-class side I've seen since Eddie's England knocked Joe Smith's Ireland side off the pedestal 12 months before that brilliant, bold, bespectacled Galtier era began. France's mission as they prepare to play bogey team Scotland is to now prove the exact opposite of that day four years ago. Power has not shifted, the course has not changed, and they are still a world-class, fully operational unit who can take Scotland apart. Because on Friday night, Ireland might just have overseen the biggest Six Nations power shift since then. They might be entering the Six Nations in a very different place to everyone else, but they're not standing still. Everything we saw on Friday night suggests, forget rebuilding, Andy Farrell's sole focus is on getting better. And with their fellow favourites for that title now dispatched, Ireland can start to dream of what comes next. What may be lingering at the end of the next four games. Soul-shattering quarterfinals may linger still in the memory, but Ireland are very much looking to the future. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. So begins the Six Nations. As we've said a number of times, I'm uh, going to look to do slightly less of the Six Nations just because it has been a big slog trying to cover every game. So this is going to be the only one we're going to get done this week, I'm afraid. I did look at where Scotland. We do have something else we're working on that hopefully next week we'll see in terms of like trying to look at the other games a bit. Um, we'll see that. Um, wanted to focus primarily on Ireland for this video. Again, kind of less than the, the ones we were doing in previous years have been completely exhausting to make. So I wanted to just look at like how Ireland dominated France, how they won that game, where it went. Uh, please let us know what you think of this, how you think it's going, you know, what you enjoy. There's plenty more around the channel. There's a video on how Ireland may fill a 10 void, one on DuPont being absent for France, both of which ended up being quite, quite, quite prominent topics. Uh, we're gonna have a look at Italy, next week regardless of how that game against ireland goes um and pick up some other stuff based on the next few weeks of the six nations hope you're wonderful hope you're lovely and we'll see you soon for more rugby to sum up tonight um hard to sum up um